We are live. Three, two, one. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download today and 30-day trial at www.audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Gerald. I'm Maya. And I'm Anais. On today's show, we're discussing To Build a Fire by Jack London. But first, I need to let you know that Literary Roadhouse is rated PG-13 for occasional potty mouth. We're really not that bad, but if you have pre-teens or teens that you want to share the show with, I encourage you to look on iTunes for the individual episode ratings and pre-listen to the episodes before sharing. iTunes is also where people leave us great comments, such as Hiroja Shibe's iTunes review, which said, An audio breakdown of short stories in a concise and fun manner. The hosts of the show have, every, have very divergent opinions on storytelling and on what is a compelling read, making the show a great listen. The hosts also make you want to read the many stories that you listen to, even when they themselves don't like the story, just to see for yourself. Great listen. That's a wonderful comment. I've actually heard through like tweets and just messages that we're prompting a lot of people to read more, which makes me feel really good. Yes, and that's a great comment that we we're diverse people with differing opinions, and um, and that's that's really the whole idea, isn't it? Get a discussion yes. going. Good. Now, if you haven't read To Build Fire yet and don't want to be spoiled, pause the podcast, read the story, then come back. So, to build a fire, yeah, the summary. We are introduced to the only human character in this story straight away. He's on the Yukon Trail, and it's cold. Very cold. About 50 degrees below zero cold. He's not worried because he's a newcomer to the trail. Initially, he's a little confused about just how cold it is. He thought it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit below zero, but in fact it was 75 below. He's on a trail to a mining camp on Henderson Creek, where a bunch of his friends are waiting for him. He has a husky dog as a companion. The dog has great instinct for travel in this wild place, but man does not. He walks along the creek bed, mostly frozen, but occasionally not. The husky breaks through the ice at one point, and he helps the animal remove the ice from its paws. Then later, he breaks through the ice, and he knows he has to stop and make a fire to thaw out. He thinks about an old man at Sulphur Creek, his starting point, who told him people shouldn't walk the creek when the temperature is below minus 50. But our character thinks the old man is a bit womanish. He doesn't realise how cold he's been getting on the trail. His fingers are frozen. He has difficulty lighting a fire. The tension builds. As we know, he's getting colder. Frostbite is attacking his face, hands and feet. And his ability to think clearly is being affected. Eventually, he realises that he's going to die and he faces it with dignity. Whereas the dog wanders off up the trail to get to the camp. So where do we want to start? Why don't we just, in general, how did everybody feel about the story? Shall I, I start? Because it was mine. I, I liked it. I, 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 again, it's a real sort of real life uh, story um, based on his, uh, his travels in, uh, on the, um, the Klondike Gold Rush. And... Um, I th I thought initially I thought it was, you know, okay. You've told me it's cold. You've told me it's cold. You've told me it's cold. But actually, it, it's it's important to to build the whole story up. And 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 I I just sort of read through. I just couldn't. I I was anxious from like halfway, and uh, loved the story. Really did. Any yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, I'm a no. I didn't like the story for many of the same reasons that Gerald loved it, so that's really interesting. The repetition of the word cold, I mean, eventually got to a point where I forgot what cold means. Like, it was a bit, yeah, I couldn't get into it. I didn't care. I wasn't anxious. <laughs> Whoa. And I'm on Gerald's side with this. I love this story. Um, I felt like it was a wonderful experience, and it wasn't... Um, it wasn't one of those stories where I read it and it was like, wham, bam, it was like this slow experience, slowly unveiling, and there was a lot of metaphor going on. I, I really loved it. It took me back to my childhood of reading Jack London and, you know, this type of literature, and I really, really am glad that Gerald, Gerald picked it. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't like it, though, Annie. <laughs> I'm ready to tear in. 
<laughs> let's let's get at it. <laughs> well, was there anything about the story you did like? Um, I will say that towards the end, when he's building the fire, like when you finally get there, you know, like five months later, when you get there, um, at least that part, I was sort of drawn into it. Like the, the drama was starting to. It was there, but by then it's kind of like something bad's going to happen to him was kind of a foregone conclusion, so it's just more of like a how will it happen. But, um, but yeah, I think that's the only part where I wasn't looking at the scroll bar. And I do like the themes that he's exploring. I just, it's like I've, I've read other stuff or seen other stuff that explores those same themes in a way that I find much more entertaining. It's interesting that you say that about the scroll bar. Okay, I'm going to own up to this. When I read this, I read it on paper, but I also listened to it on audiobook. Um, LibriVox has this great recording by this grizzled-voiced old man. Like, you can just hear, like, grizzled, like, the kind of guy that you would expect to be up there. And, um, and it's read very slowly. And... I felt like it gave me a different experience having both read it and then listened to it in that way. Um, I felt like it was better as an audiobook than it necessarily was on paper. And I think that's because it slowed me down and it allowed me to close my eyes and experience it in a way that I wasn't necessarily experiencing on paper. And so I do think this is one of those stories that perhaps is better out loud than just silently reading it to yourself. Um, I also think it's interesting that you mention you've read other stuff like this because this is a very, Jack London is a very old story, but he was like part of a whole movement. And so if you're well read, you probably have read a lot of stuff like this because he influenced a lot of writers. Um, as a child, I remember reading White Fang I remember reading um, Call of the Wild, and then later on, I read another author who was obviously influenced, um, a children's author, um, Julia the Wolves. And I remember reading these stories and getting so involved that I tried to run away to Alaska because I wanted to go live in a cave and get a pet wolf. And, like, and I was reading, I was reading Clan of the Cave Bears. So I was like in my backyard practicing how to do like how to use a slingshot. And I got lost on my way to the bus, and my mother was cracking up so badly because I couldn't run away properly that she didn't even scold me because she was too busy heckling me. So that was my experience. And so reading this type of literature literally just takes me way back. But I think it's partially because I read it so early, and so I was reading this type of stuff before I'd already seen newer stuff that was kind of influenced by this type of stuff. And I, I, I quite liked the the very slow build-up um, because you really get a feel for the environment and the type of environment and all the way through that build-up there's there's little sort of little dropped hints about how he you know he knows best like the like I said in the summary you know the the, the guy where he started out was um, they called him. Called her. Uh, called him womanish, a bit, a bit <laughs> which womanish. I thought was really funny. <laughs> for, for, yeah, for warning him about going out when it's so cold, and that he knows better, and and the dog knows better too, and and there's there's quite a lot of um, toing and froing between him and the dog, and the the dog is so aware of his surroundings and so clued in, and he isn't, and he just thinks, yeah, it's you know, it's a trudge, it's a long walk. But I'll get there, and my buddies will be there, and we'll have dinner and uh, a few beers, and it'll be fine. But um, but he just doesn't realise what he's what he's getting himself into. And I, I yeah. love that, that slow build up, and that the you know the, the the mentions of of scratching his cheek, you know, rubbing his cheek, and and losing the the feeling in in various parts, and and you think, yeah, this this is frostbite starting up. But he doesn't know; he's just not aware of it at all. Yeah, I think it's really. In I think it's funny because as a modern reader, it's so easy to read things quickly, and this is not the first story where I've mentioned. You know, I decided to read it out loud, or I decided to listen to it, and I think part of the reason why reading a story out loud gives me a different experience is because it forces me to slow down, because I'm so used to reading fast-paced stories. It, being forced to slow down allows me to experience a lot of the different layers of the story. 
And I found the story very layered as far as theme and symbolism, and which brings me to the question, what did you guys think the story was about? Like, yeah, it's about a guy who's going to, you know, walk off and die. But what is the story really about? I, I think it's it's... It's it's about a number of things, but I think it's about his his pride, um, about how he he thinks he knows best, and he knows the rules, but he's he's just not aware of what's going on, and he's not he's not paying attention to the the signs that that we as the reader are picking up on, and and he's just ignoring and not thinking. So 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 it's his pride and um, that that you know principally. Um, is is what I, I I got from it, um, and you know both both his his dealings with the dog and and his mention of the the guy behind at the start point, you know he's the the people telling him, you know, <laughs> as part from the environment is telling him, you know this is this is dangerous stuff, but he's he's just saying yeah it's a bit cold okay. <laughs> How about you, Annie's? Yeah, for theme, I had a similar thing. The first thing I wrote down was uh, hubris and folly. It's like one of those kind of classic tales of this guy who believes he's bigger than something that everyone knows he's not bigger than, and in this case, nature, right? How inconquerable nature is, especially such a hostile environment. And then doing a little bit sort of more digging, um, there's also whenever there's death in a story, I always look for kind of really sad and dreary existential themes because it has the whole he's alone throughout the entire thing in a hostile mm -hmm. environment that's completely unforgiving and then he dies alone and even his purpose for where he was going wasn't well defined he's gonna meet the boys at the camp at six but to what end right there's no sort of service that he's gonna provide them that they're gonna provide him it's just sort of like a camp so there's this kinda like you know it's a little sort of I want to say metaphorical for the existential view of life as being completely alone, hostile, and unforgiving. It had that thread throughout it as well. Um, you know, for me, three paragraphs in, I wrote um, that the theme was just too bluntly put because it was very specifically, he mentioned fragility, and the fragility of man is such like a trite and cliche theme that permeates everything in our society. But as I was reading it, I realized that there is a reason for that fragility and it is because we're separated from our animal nature, from our instinct. And so this man is a modern man. He doesn't really understand what cold is. And I think it's interesting that it's said that he doesn't have the imagination to understand how much danger he's in. Because usually people with a lot of imagination are considered you know, foolish, and they get themselves into all kinds of danger because they've got their head in the clouds. But in this case, he needs imagination in order to imagine just how dangerous the situation is. And then the dog, the fact that when the dog realizes, you know, that it's dangerous to cross the creek and he hesitates, the man is so separated from his own instincts that he doesn't recognize the dog's hesitation as a warning and he forces the dog to go ahead until the dog falls through the ice. And then further on, it's stated that the dog has never had any kindness from the man. He's only been whipped verbally or physically from the man. And so the dog had no real variety to, you know, want to tell the man or express to the man what that he was in danger. Whereas a man that's closer to nature, a man that maybe cares for his animal in a different way, may have had a dog that would have run ahead to camp and gotten help, or may have hesitated to cross the creek because the dog hesitated. And he would have known not to build the fire underneath, you know, a tree because there's freaking snow in the tree that's going to fall down and put out your damn fire. <laughs> like, seriously, dude. <laughs> He's so separated from nature and his own animal instincts that he, do he doesn't think of, okay, well... I'm having a hard time building a fire. Maybe I should dig a hole and get in a hole in the snow. Like these are things that doesn't go through his mind. It's it's about you know imagination versus knowing, knowing versus instinct, man versus beast. And for me, those were the layers that I saw throughout the story that I found really interesting. Yeah, and I would add to that that um, 
there was many ways that this guy could have been defeated by nature. He could have just gotten lost and got caught out there in the middle of the night. Or he could have uh, fallen through the ice and drowned or gone under the ice. But it was very specifically that the fire was extinguished. And the fire is sort of like a symbol for humanity is try trying to control nature, right? The way that man controls the environment or one of the ways that he does it. It's also the most colorful thing in the imagery that Jack London paints in your mind. And then it gets snuffed out with the, kind of like the whiteness of everything else. Which, you know, yeah. so I was saying there's... Imagery-wise, I did like some of the stuff that Jack London did, right? There was particularly the part where he's actually, you know, fighting with the fire, with the dog, everything else. Um, but in the beginning, I found it really hard to get into his voice. And I think that also made it hard for me to get into it, even though, because like when you were saying that the themes were very blunt up front, I was still in the beginning just struggling to listen to the way that Jack London is talking throughout the And I think story. that was the benefit of, of both reading it aloud and listening to the audiobook because it was able I was able to get into that and also the benefit of having read Jack London before as a child it makes it much easier for me to get into his voice because his voice is very specific like I can tell a Jack London story like you can give me a story blind with no title no author and I'm gonna be able to figure out probably you know 50 percent of the way through that it's Jack London because to me his voice is that specific um, and I think it's that specific because I read him so young. But I can see how it is a slower story. And so if you're reading it, you know, the way we normally read a story, I might not enjoy it as much. Like, I just finished Middlesex, and I got to say, I enjoyed it a lot better for spreading it out over a month and a half than if I had just read it in a week. Because it's not that type of story. I had to do it a different, I had to read it a different way. Read it you know, 10, 20 pages at a time, sit down, think about it. And I kind of felt like that about this story, like, you know, you write a couple of paragraphs and then I would think about it or I would take notes. And there haven't been a lot of short stories where I've taken notes as I was reading that we've done so far. Um, most of them I read them and then I take notes or I read them and I might highlight something in my Kindle. Um, this one I definitely was taking notes as I was reading it, which I normally don't do for short stories. I normally do that for essays or like, um, like I did that for Middlesex, um, like really complicated literature. And so it was, a, it was a very different experience, which I kind of like, like I like that type of reading. And if you don't like, you know, reading where you have to think about it as you're reading it, I don't think you're really going to like the story. I think it's going to be annoying. <laughs> did everybody freeze? Oh, maybe, maybe Gerald did. <laughs> he looks very focused. Yes, he looks very focused. <laughs> hey, well, I, I can sort of um, keep going. Well, I think I think for me the language. I think part of it might also be this is my first exposure to London, and I don't. I haven't read too many. Um, I mean, I've read some of his contemporaries, but a completely different kind of genre or style. But um, I found it dry in a way that wasn't rewarding because there's some voices that are dry but you can kind of like they'll have a certain rhythm to it where like the dryness and that rhythm combines well for me this was kind of like dry long repetitive sentences with the word cold 50 times per sentence like that I think that was kind of you know for, which I think is personal taste I think some people kind of like that repetition I think Gerald was saying he liked that repetition Gerald, who's gone now? I think I'm actually going Gerald obviously has dropped out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn on my again. Let's see if that helps. Okay. Because I would like to not have to open up a new Hangout. No, we shouldn't have to. He can dial back in. And we'll just cut. Yeah, but I'm getting we'll weird freezing, too. Thank goodness we do triple unders. If we didn't, our podcast would sound so bad. Mm. <sighs> <laughs> All about the triple unders, dude. There he is. There he is. Hi, Gerald. I'm going to turn the camera off, too, just so. Yeah. Having issues. Gerald, are you there yet? He's over there like an old Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine if that was a commercial today? It was such a good, it was such like an iconic commercial, too. That's what's so funny. Yeah, marketing but if you is really that changed. Today, it would be so dated. Everyone would be like, "Your standard is reception." Mm -mm. I'm not going to try it anymore. <laughs> yeah, evidently he's still having issues. Yeah, this is okay. We can wait for him. 
Yeah, maybe people who are watching live. I don't know. Who is, hey, but... this is the full experience. The people that decide to watch live, this is why they watch live. They want to see us fall on our faces. <laughs> Any normal person is going to go to the website and listen to the amazing polished audio version of the podcast that comes out every Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> That was not an ad read. No, actually, <laughs> like clockwork. <sighs> so you didn't read any Jack London as a child either? No. No. I was really into, like, I'm hardcore fantasy sci-fi type kid. Like, yeah. yeah. But this was – where I live, Jack London was a really big deal because he was – he. We have like Jack London Square, and there's like the there's like a lot of monuments to him. And he was part of my elementary school reading, and he was right up there with like Huckleberry Finn, Jack London. You know, it it was there were certain stories that like everybody read, um, Treasure Island. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. He was on that level, and so well, I I can't imagine like anybody that I know that hasn't actually read it. But it might also be a difference in generation. It could be, or I just forgot. It's, I mean, if it was elementary school, that's, you know, it, definitely not in high school. I would have remembered. But if it was. No, like, no, no. It was like elementary, middle school, you yeah, know. But also when I was growing up, we didn't have a large amount of YA fiction. It was mm -hmm. either you're reading children's books or adult books. So we transitioned into literature earlier. I think um, nowadays a lot of teens read YA, which is really cool because they're like, it, it talks all these different stories. But when I was a kid, there really wasn't like a definitive. A definition between children's you know something between children's literature and adult literature it was either you're reading kids books or you're reading regular books and that's just the way it was and so yeah because yeah. it's not a children's book but it it was something that most of the kids that i knew read around sixth or seventh grade probably yeah well it's funny because you were saying earlier that you think part of what helped you get into the story is you had read jack london before and you love him already and i'm thinking i recently started reading um snow crash by neil stevenson and the first chapter i'm like on the edge of my seat giddy because this is the kind of stuff that i liked as a kid uh it's in the future and it's like a sci-fi pizza delivery and i'm like anxious <laughs> over this pizza delivery because it's sci-fi and it's cool and he's got like this um if he doesn't do it in 30 minutes uh the owner of the cosa nostra pizza uncle enzo flies from italy lands on a helicopter to like beg the person who got the late pizza not to sue like it's just ridiculous but i love it you know yeah and i think that, that that's also but then i'm i'm explaining this to a friend of mine because i was reading it you know at the beach with a friend and i'm explaining it to her super giddy and she's just like not at all into it unfazed and i think it's just you know maybe she never really read that as a kid or just never learned. I think it's one of those things that people learn to love younger. I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of older people who would pick up. Well, I uh, think that, that story kind of reminds me of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, like that type of like kind of goofy off the wall, like crazy story. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily that you had to read that story as a kid, but I think there's a type of literature that if you get a taste of it young, you are able to appreciate it more. Like if I start off reading only fast paced stories, then when I go to read a really slow paced story, it's going to feel boring. I'm going to have a hard time getting into it. It's going to be a difficult transition. Whereas if I start off reading slower paced stories and then move to faster paced stories, it's a little bit easier of a transition. At least I felt that way because when I was a kid, you know, even down to the stories my mom was reading to me, they were older literature. And so I'm a lot more comfortable with stories that take, you know, a really long time to build up. Um, whether it's paper or movies, you know, I can sit down and watch Voyager that not the Voyager with the space, but the Voyager with the old guy that goes to Paris and it's freaking like the slowest movie ever made. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have no problem with it because I started off reading slower literature. But I do think if you've started off reading like adventure stories or sci fi, then slower literature is like, come on, get move already, do something. And I don't, I think that's a perfectly natural reaction. Uh, I think that's probably why everybody nowadays is, is having such a hard time with, with literary fictions because a lot of it's slower, but people aren't used to slower stuff anymore. And it's just less interesting to people. Um, can you check with uh, Gerald either on Twitter or something yeah, to did. see just how he's not. doing? Because I can't, my computer will freeze if I do it. Yeah, I just opened Twitter and he's not... Um... 
He's not responding. No, I don't think he opens Twitter either because it sucks up his bandwidth. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Let's see if we can get him back on here because we need our Gerald. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see on my phone if I can pull him up. Um. And we do need Gerald because he loved it so much. Well, so did you. But. Yeah, but we still need Gerald. We can't be down yeah. to two hosts. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Because then it'll oh, just no. be Anise and Maya arguing. <laughs> and <laughs> the podcast is like two hours long. <laughs> well, we're both opinionated. That could go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because when you were talking about – um. I mean, you can probably salvage bits and pieces of this. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But um, when you were talking about, you know, being trained at a younger age through just habit, reading slower stories, I realized, you know what? I think I'm spoiled for comedy and humor. Because, for example, remember Tony Takatani? That was a super slow story. But there was all these mm -hmm. little jokes that kept me going. If I don't have a joke to hook me through, I think sometimes maybe I'm just like a baby. Like, I just need that. And which is funny because when you were talking about the jokes all the way through, like there was one point that I found funny, but I actually didn't see any other jokes in, in it. Like mm. I didn't see the humor in it. And I think that's just because like I'm like a grumpy old man who doesn't see humor <laughs> in anything that thinks all the world sucks and that children are evil, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was interesting when you were talking about the humor in that story because I literally didn't see it. Like there was one spot where I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. But I literally didn't see the humor in the story. Yeah. <laughs> totally over my head. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then this story has like no jokes. No, all. there's there's no humor. It, it's all about the reality of dying. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> Actually, that's the other thing. I realize we don't talk about character as much in story unless there's like one we super need to. But like in this one... At the end of it, I didn't care that he died, which is horrible. I've never not cared about the death of a fictional character. And this time he died, I'm like, well, what's going to happen to the dog? Is the dog going to make it? <laughs> well, at least some, you cared about somebody. But actually, I don't think that was um, – I think that was the proper response. I think that – the man really wasn't written in a way to prompt sympathy. I think you were supposed to have more sympathy for the dog because the dog was the only one with any common sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and that, he was stuck with yeah. this man, he was yeah. stuck with an abusive man. <laughs> and it isn't that I wanted the man to die. I really didn't care. There was a part of me that was just like, like you're dumb. Whatever happens to you happens. If you survive, well, you're also lucky. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like. Mm. I just well, I remember I kind of felt like that about the Cheater's Guide to Love. You know, that's my problem with Juno Diaz, and I keep trying to read him because I want to like him because I like the content, I like his the his structure and his use of language, but I literally could care less about his character. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's funny that Ray Bradbury quote. I think it was you who said it last week that he um, was going on about how in the New Yorker there's no more stories with the, uh, short stories don't have plot anymore. <laughs> I'm like, is he talking about Juno Diaz? Because it sounds like he's talking about Juno Diaz. I think he's talking about everybody. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but definitely Juno Diaz would fit into his criticism. Uh, and it's funny because I want to like Juno Diaz because I really, really like him as a man. I like like um, how he approaches writing. I like, like I said, I love his use of language. I love his story structure. I think it's he has really amazing ways of structuring stories. Um, but I'm still searching for a Juno Diaz story that I'm in love with. Like, I know there's going to be one because I, there's got to be one, but I, I still haven't found it. Um, I still, I like the brief and wonderful life of Oscar Wilde, mm -hmm. but I wasn't in love with any of the characters. And, um, there was just yeah. something missing in his literature for me which is frustrating because I want to like him. And then um, I was listening to um, the Saturday show. They did a Juno Diaz story. They didn't, t the, they did a blind read where the story they read, they didn't tell the people in the workshop what story they were, who the author was or that it was a famous author or anything. Obviously, as soon as you see Junior, it's got to be, Junior's in every story. But they so. had no idea who it was. There was only one lady who knew who it was. 
And um, <laughs> and it was so funny listening to the critiques. He's like, this is no story. And um, you know the guy who always kind of just rubs me the wrong way? He's like, if this ends up being some Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times author, I'm just going to be so mad. <laughs> dying i was dying 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 the whole time because <laughs> yeah. of course i knew who it was right off the bat i was just like <laughs> i mean real talk i like juno diaz more than i don't like him and i like that that voice yeah and that that voice exists because so much of the literature that's celebrated right now is not that so that's great but you can od on him i od'd on him because you know i read a few of his novels and then we had done um his cheater's guide to love for this podcast and then all of a sudden i read drown and i'm like it's junior everywhere everywhere you look yeah. it's just junior so you can od on him very quickly yeah i think because he's constantly using the same characters and this and the characters are so much a part of him that it's like okay get off the therapy couch and write something a little different please um yeah and, and you know uh-huh and, like I said, and he isn't the first author to do that. Bonnegut would also do that, where he had like the same characters that would like mm -hmm. appear in his stories. And it's just like, but the thing is, Junior is so unlikable that it's yeah. like you can only take so much of him. Yeah, because he's a total jerk. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, you know what? Uh, mm, I would say The Brief and Wonderful Life of uh, Oscar Wilde, Junior's in it, but he's not the protagonist and yeah. so that one you may actually like but my other problem with him and the whole situation with artists of color is that there's so few of us that it's easy to get held up even if there's something significantly lacking in your art and it's frustrating to me that if i don't like juno diaz like who else do i turn to what other modern interesting experimental you know, American immigrant Latino authors do I turn to? And there are other authors, but we don't see them. We don't hear of them. They're not famous. They're not widely published. And that's the frustrating thing because I'm like, okay, well, if there was hundreds and hundreds of amazing authors being published, maybe people wouldn't give him a pass on using the same character that's totally unlikable because we would be gr gravitating to some other author. And, and it's just frustrating, yeah. totally frustrating. It makes me yeah. grumpy, it makes me very, very grumpy. Mm -hmm. uh, we need and more right. writers of color. Yeah. And you're right that the brief and wondrous life of Oscar Wilde is my favorite of his. And it's because it is less junior. And I liked Oscar quite a bit in his little sad sack way. Yeah, I loved Oscar. I, I really, really did. But there was too much distance in the story for me to love him on a level that would mm. really sink me into the story and make me fall in love with the story. Like it was a story that I really, that I liked. It was a story I appreciated. I'm glad I read it. But it's not one of my, you know, top stories that I can't wait to reread. Like I'm not going to reread The Brief and Wonderful Life of Oscar Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other books that I have the urge to reread. But I may never get around to it because there's other things I need to read. But I don't even want to reread it, right. and which is a shame, you know, because I I kind of wish that he was an author that I felt like I wanted to, um, you know. And he does the workshop, the Vono Voices workshop, and I want to go. I want to learn from him. There are so many things I can learn from him, but character probably not so much. Like I don't l appreciate how how distant he is from his characters. Yeah. I actually felt in the brief, and I mean, we're not even talking about the short story anymore. No, but, we're waiting to see if Gerald figures out his yeah. tech support. Yeah, but I, I he felt hasn't emailed me yet. Yeah, I mean, this can be bonus material. My ladies totally. talk about whatever pops into their head. But mm -hmm. uh, in the brief and wondrous life of Oscar, wow, a character that I was really sympathetic towards was Oscar's mother back when she was still in the Dominican Republic. Belly, mm -hmm. I mean that. Uh, I mean, heart was changed. That was good. Actually, now that you mentioned that, I think that was probably one of my favorite parts of the book. That was the part of the book where I stopped having to rewind it because I listened to it on audiobook. And there were parts, a lot of the book where I would get distracted after I would have to rewind. Like that's a big barometer to me of how much I'm enjoying the story because it just didn't engross me, but it was something that I kept wanting to read. So I kept rewinding it. But at that point, I, I didn't rewind like once during the whole story of ballet. Uh, it was just such an engrossing story. Like I stopped doing the dishes and I was just on the couch listening. And uh, yeah, you're right. That was a really, that's an interesting point because in that case, I was much closer to the character mm -hmm. than I was with Oscar. And I, I wanted to get close to Oscar because Oscar was a voice and a character that we don't usually see. And a lot of 
Juno Diaz's characters are these guys that are all machismo and strong or whatever. And Oscar was this immigrant guy, nerdy. And I wanted to get closer to him. I felt like he was a really interesting character. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why I got so frustrated because I wanted to get closer to him and he wouldn't let me. I think I was closer to him because I grew up knowing people like Oscar because I grew up in the area that Juno Diaz is writing about in New Jersey. And like like when he talks about like, oh, going down to Edgewater, like this isn't the brief and wonder of Oscar Wilde. Uh, going to Edgewater to the Japanese marketplace on a date. I'm like, that's Mitsuwa. Been there. I know. So, like, I think I had that little connection. So, I'm seeing Oscar. I'm like, oh, yeah, he sat in the back of my class. Like, I know Oscar. So, mm-hmm. like, I think I projected onto a lot of my own experience. And that might also be why I like Juno Diaz more than some other people because it's like, oh, he's like a voice of my people. And I think as I'm, I I told you, I'm doing that whole experiment that Ray Bradbury proposed where you read a a short story, an essay, and a poem every day. Mm -hmm. I'm working my way through a collection of essays by Zadie Smith, Changing My Mind. And there's one essay in there where she's talking about um, Nabokovian versus Barth's reading. They both wrote essays on the nature of reading and the relationship between the author and the reader. And Barth's reading was very much in order for the reader, in order for the story to come alive, the author has to die. And the whole idea, you know, in the 90s, there was that whole um, movement. Well, maybe not because you were really young, but there was a whole movement of when you read a story, then you would just take the story and change it into whatever you wanted it to be to represent whatever you had in you. Like you were the creator of the story that you read rather than the author being the creator. Mm -hmm. And Navikovian reading was very much the author has a message and you're reading it to, to experience what the author wants you to experience. And I'm realizing that I'm a Navikovian reader, so I don't need to understand the character from a personal standpoint, but also I expect the author to fulfill his promise of giving me the full experience that he's ex- that he's wanting me to experience. So when I'm reading a story like The Brief and Wonderful Life of Oscar Wilde, I'm frustrated because I can see that the author has a message, but he's not expressing it in a way that fully allows me to experience it. I don't feel like I should have to have lived in New Jersey to quote unquote get the story. The mm-hmm. author should make me get it, whether I've lived that experience or not. And so for me, it's a letdown. Whereas for other readers, they read in a different way. They're very much more creative as they're reading. They're going to read that story in a completely different way and maybe not even feel any sense of frustration or anything because they're it, they're wanting to fill in those blanks on their own. For me, I want the author to fill in those blanks. I want him to give me an experience I've never had before. If I only wanted to experience what I already experienced, I wouldn't be reading a book. I'd be I'd close my eyes and remember. And that's just a different type of reading. And it's realizing that that has a whole bunch of repercussions, not only on how I critique, but on how I write. And it's part of the reason why I have such a hard time accepting the type of fiction I write, because it, it, I feel like the sense of responsibility that is annoying. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what kind I am. I feel like the cop would be like, oh, it depends on the story. But more likely than not, I probably fill in the blanks just because that's how I am with everything else. I'll watch a movie and I'll fill in blanks. Or I'll have a conversation with someone else and I'm like guessing at what they're really saying. So I guess I'm just naturally a little presumptuous. So I, mm-hmm. I probably fill in blanks when I read. Yeah. I highly recommend the essay. It's an amazing essay. It made me really essay. think. made me really, really think about how I am as a reader and a writer. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll I'll shoot you the link. Mm -hmm. And it it does look like this will probably be extra content and I'll put the content in the down bar. Um, I can't get a hold of him. I emailed him. I've got nothing. Do you want to just continue the podcast or can you try again to email him? Yeah. Or I mean, we've given him so much time. I would think that he would have had time to um, start a computer. Yeah, restart his computer. If we need to do a new Hangout, I'm fine with that, but I don't know if that's what's needed. I have no idea. You want me to email him? Because I think he's a Twitter guy. He's always on Twitter. So I don't Yeah. Know if, if he's not on Twitter, I feel like he won't be on email, but I can open Gmail and run Google Hangouts. I'm a big deal right now, so I'll do both. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, there's no email from him. Yeah, I've got no tweets. We should do phone numbers. We never exchange that, but I know. 
that we do mm -hmm. so we would know for folks watching this live <laughs> You know what? This was the one day that I accidentally put it on live. I was like, oh, well, I'll leave it. It'll be fine. <laughs> like, literally, I had this conversation with myself. Because remember, we said since we're recording on Mondays, we would go ahead and put it unlisted and then, like, make it live later. I'm yeah. like, oh, man. I shouldn't have listened to myself. I was like, oh, I accidentally put it on live. I should make a new hangout. No, it'll be fine. Nothing bad's happened so far. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gerald and I have a joke. You're never there for the joke, though. Anytime no. you fall out of a call or like when we're trying to set up in the beginning, we're like the ritual is complete. Like we need this to happen <laughs> in order to have a successful podcast. Well, now the he ritual. knows what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this I'm sure our funny. listeners would love to know about the ritual. I, Which is like I, I'm not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always me, right? I kind of am happy that it's not me this time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it's very liberating. <laughs> like, now you know what it's like. <laughs> uh, man. Yeah, I mean, do we continue? I don't even know how much more I have to say other than I didn't like it, even though I get what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. we. Ha I think we had a lot more to talk about because we were talking about what we liked, but we didn't get a chance to talk about the parts that didn't work yet. And yeah. I would like to get into that. So yeah. let's go ahead and log out, get mm -hmm. Gerald, get a hold of Gerald, and then reschedule. We, should we may have to reschedule for tomorrow even. Should we just leave the room? Oh, okay. Tomorrow no. I can do it very late, which would be early for Gerald on Wednesday. Yeah, then if we can figure out some way to record today, that would be great. Um, let's just go ahead and shut down the recording, try to get a hold of Gerald. Go ahead and shut it down now. Um, okay. Send me the file because some of this is good for yeah. extra content. Yeah. People will like to hear us. Mm -hmm. um, let me stop the broadcast.